So today, what we're going to do together is that we're going to talk about how we can grow the world's economies, create lots of jobs, and make heaps of money. So does that all sound good? Good. We're in the middle of the strangest revolution in history. Those who have taken control of our economies, our political systems, our families and our communities are ignorant of the power they possess. Blinded by prejudice and subconscious self-sabotage, they believe they hold no currency. They participate in a narrative that it describes them as irrelevant, impotent and invisible. The truth is that they are the power pack of this century and their numbers and influence grow stronger every year. For the billions of educated and affluent 50 to 75 year olds in the first world, life is great. They have the highest disposable income of any group, they are relatively healthy and life happiness is hitting its peak. With life expectancy on the rise, we can label this period our third quarter and I'm going to abbreviate this today to Q3. So the third quarter of life holds many opportunities for the youthful Q3s to explore life projects with the confidence and the security that they've earned. Uh, they're a group that is uh, almost ignored by product developers and marketers around the world, so it's not just Australia. And um, the data and information that I'm going to give you today is part of an ebook that I'm launching today. You can download it at thepowerpack.com.au and I'll give you a link at the end as well. So if you want to know where I've got my numbers and my data, it's all in the, the various resources that are at the end of the ebook. So I want to take you through who they are, how powerful they are, and we'll go sort of category by category because I don't know who you all are or what industry you're from, so I'm going to cover quite a few of those industries. So firstly, by 2020, most adult consumers will be over 50 years old. So we're talking about over 50%. So if you, you don't have a strategy for this consumer group, you're missing your biggest target consumer group by far. For the rest of the 21st century, the fastest growing consumer segment in the world will actually be 60 plus rather than 50 plus. They have the highest disposable income of any consumer group. They've paid off mortgages, they've sent children to school, so they have a lot of money to spend. In fact, it'll account to 15 trillion worldwide by 2020. So their spending power is enormous. But only 5% of advertising targets them. So what this means to us in this room is a massive opportunity to talk to them. And so the way that you have to talk to them is quite different. They're, it's not a lot of marketers say we're pitching to a mindset. They have a different mindset to, the, to what you're currently pitching at. And if your target consumer group is uh, 20 to 35 or 20 to 30, as we're all briefed on by our clients and, and by um, our brands, it's completely the wrong target market. You can target that market, but you need another strategy for this group. Otherwise, as I said, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity and plenty of cash. So I'm going to start with health and tell you about what they think about their health. So firstly, they feel good about their health. They feel very positive about their health and in fact according to the ABS, um, most people in this third quarter of life are healthy with minimum disabilities. So they've got disabilities like lack of um, fading eyesight that can happen at any time of your life and fading hearing into the 70s but mostly they're extraordinarily healthy. They're the highest users of vitamins, supplements and nutraceuticals. So if you're in the health and wellness industry, you need a strategy for these guys because they're well over 50% of your target consuming group. Mental health is really important to them. So it's a fear factor for the Q3s. They have a certain control over their body and they can work on keeping their body fit and healthy, but they do have, they're a little bit paranoid about their mental health and degradation in mental health. So anything that you can do to support them is going to be very popular. I'm thinking especially apps and, and games, etc. Um, so the peak age for happiness, there's been numerous academic studies on both humans and primates to show that um, happiness actually goes in a, a U-curve. So you're at your happiest point at about 20, uh, 21, and then you become relatively unhappy, which at, you go down to a low in your mid-40s to early 50s, and then it starts increasing again, where you peak up again at 70. So as I said, it's been noticed in humans and primates. So if you're in your 40s and you're feeling a little bit depressed, it's very, very normal. Is this a biological thing? You don't have to blame your wife, your husband, your kids, your job. You're normally going to be unhappy in that 40 period. But the great thing for this group 
is that they're just going to be coming happier and happier and happier during their Q theory period. So they're, um, it's, a, it's a stage of life that you should look forward to. Now onto the beauty segment. So over 50% of cosmetics are purchased by women over 50. Now most women over 60 don't seek beauty products with anti-aging properties. So it's about the one of the most cynical consumer groups on the planet. Uh, they don't believe you, they don't trust you, and they know that the word anti-aging is not possible anyway. You can't reverse the aging process, it's impossible. So I assume that the cosmetics industry launches these products for women in their 30s who are a little bit more anxious about the visible signs of aging, but they definitely don't ring true to this consumer group. These guys will go for quality over price, so it makes them even more interesting as a consumer group because they're going to spend more money on their beauty products and the beauty industry has done really well in selling that quality message. So they're going to, each basket they buy, they'll spend more than their younger sisters. I'm speaking mostly about women because women hold most of the purchasing power. Um, but even in things like automotive, where men have a large slice of the pie, they're still over 50% of all purchases. Most dislike shopping for cosmetics, and actually I was looking at some figures last week um, out of Australia, and said it said 20% of 45 to 64 year old Australian women enjoy, enjoy shopping for cosmetics, 20%, so 80% don't enjoy it. So when you consider that department stores actually front face with their, with their um, cosmetic section, it's such an important part of the overall business in driving people up the escalator, they're getting it completely wrong. So these women don't like going in and shopping for cosmetics in department stores. In terms of cosmetic surgery, they're going for tweakments over surgery, so they're not doing your full facelift where you go under um, with anaesthetic. They're doing day uh, treatments, so mini facials, Botox, uh, injectables, etc. And those are definitely on the rise. Because also being cynical, they know that they can't get the type of results that they're going to get out of creams, so they're just going straight for cosmetic treatments. Okay, so fashion. This is the most fascinating part because it's um, the greatest opportunity in retail. So women 45 to 65 outspend under 35s. So when you go to any shopping centre or high street, you'd be... It, Almost every store is targeted to under 35s, um, but they do outspend in every category. So we're talking apparel, shoes, accessories, everything. Even more fascinating is it's both in-store and online. So we're finding that women, uh, you know, what we used to believe is that, okay, they go in-store, but they're not shopping online. They are shopping online. A lot of cosmetics shopping online as well because they don't want to go into the in-store environment but fashion as well, they outspend in every category. Most feel like they are being ignored by retailers, so that's both in the environment of the store, the attention that they receive by sales staff, and the offer. So the cut of the clothes and the way that clothes are presented are just uh, not suiting their needs. One of, the, um, one of the retailers that I investigated is a retailer called Blue Illusion, not many people, you know, when I talk to people about them, not many people know them, but they're a huge success story in Australia. They've got 120 stores. They're making a hell of a lot of nice profit because they're one of the only ones to really offer a fashionable um, and great fitting clothes for these, these older, older consumers. Blue Illusion, yeah. Uh, they're a privately owned company. The other thing about these women is they've got body confidence. So after about the age of 50, women start feeling really comfortable in their own skin. Um, you know, it's a shame that the 20s and 30s don't have the body confidence as the over 50s because, you know, you look back into your 20s and think, you know, I wish I, I, wish I had have looked at that body in a different way. But they're really comfortable in, in their body. So you don't... Every, every woman likes to have clothes that make them look thinner. That's just something that we do. If something makes us look thinner and fits, we generally buy it. So I've seen a lot of um, exit surveys from, uh, from clothing rooms, from retailers, and if, uh, if something fits, we'll buy it because generally it doesn't fit. But if you can write, um, strike the right chord here, you'll definitely win in fashion. These women also, the other thing they do is that they shop for their husbands. So they're not only influential with women's fashion, but they're hugely influential in men's fashion. They'll pick what hubby is going to wear. But <laughs> they're really price conscious. So you have to discount or 
uh, give them a coupon or you need to, they, they don't see the quality price equation in fashion. Fashion's done a terrible job in selling the quality equation to women of this target market. They want a discount. They will not buy full price, especially online. Okay, so technology. This is one of these things that it's a very old stereotype that older people don't know how to use computers. Um, by 2018, the difference in technology use between over and under 50s will be negligible. They're using the same, uh, they'll be using the same devices as you are. They'll be using, I should say we, I turned 52 years ago. We'll be using the same devices as you do. Very internet com confident, internet savvy. Um, they know how to work and run their computers. Um, they seem to have bypassed the laptop, so they've gone straight from desktop to tablet. They love tablets. So this group actually really drove the tablet market over the past three years. If any of you got grandparents, you know, a lot of them are on tablets. They love them. They take photos with them. It's been a huge boon for people in the 50 to 75 year, year market. But another opportunity here is they really hate apps. So on average, they will download and use one app, just one. So they don't seem to understand apps and the benefit of apps. So I think that with that information, armed with that information, they would use more apps. But at the moment, there's just, they're not app users. I mean, the great thing about this market too is it tends to lag behind. So whereas if you're from fashion to technology, if you're trying to be on the bleeding edge all the time, um, you've got nothing that's proven. With this market, you can already see what works and just market in a different way to them. So it, it makes it a, them a lot easier in terms of product selection and curation. They feel patronised in store by technology sales staff, but I don't think they're alone here. I've only seen research on this particular group, but I, I'm assuming that's universal. But they do feel like they're either spoken up to or spoken down to, but not at the right level. They like a lot of information in store. They like to spend a lot of time with sales staff, but they uh, are totally dissatisfied. There's a couple of specialist retailers in New York that have just popped up for this target, which is more about education and tuition and short courses that's going really well. Really high users of Facebook and massive users of YouTube. So if you do want to market to them, they love video content, they love instructional videos, um, not so much storytelling um, because they're so cynical. So if you're going to tell a story about your brand, they're probably not going to be very interested in that, but they really like to be shown how to do things. And 49% are gamers, which is surprising, but don't think consoles, think uh, computer gaming and, you and phone gaming. But the gamification of information is really important because if this group love games and you're trying to get you know, a social message or some kind of a message out there to them, that it would really benefit you if you started looking at gamification of your information. Okay, so the workplace. So a third of the workforce will be over 50 by 2020. So it's a big change in the workplace. And you know, when we talk about diversification in the workplace, we normally talk about um, sex, gender, um, ethnicity, etc. It's it, age really isn't spoken about a hell of a lot, but we'll have to get used to working in multi generations. And ageism goes both ways. We find older people being ageist against younger people, and same the other way around. So we kind of need to let go of some of those stereotypes if we're going to work together nicely. Pre-timement is very important in this Q3 area. So in the old days, their parents uh, retired at age 65. They got their gold watch and they finished, and that was it. Um, and I think that, you know, in terms of longevity and, you know, living longer and happier, the idea of working longer is something that's, that's very important. So people don't want to retire, so they sort of do a pre-timement. A lot of them are taking gap years, so they'll take a year off to explore the world and then come back. Um, the gap years are very popular, especially in the US. But yeah, this sort of staggered retirement will be the way to go. Seniorpreneurs are on the rise. So lots of startups and entrepreneurship in this 50 to 75 year old market. They, um, some, some of them have been retrenched. There's a lot of retrenchments in this cohort. So they're deciding to start up their own business. Another thing I was reading is in the UK, in 2013, nearly one quarter of new ventures was started by people 55 to 64, and that's growing every year, and similar, similar numbers in the UK. So when we think about entrepreneurs, 
you, d you generally stereotype as someone young. But more and more, senior people are creating their own business. And, you know, I think that they should be celebrated just as much as, you know, your 21-year-old starting a new business. They're working by choice. So the World Health Organization especially has been um, very critical of countries and cultures that force people to, um, to retire at a certain age because most people don't want to. So um, all, all around the world we're seeing these figures that if people are working, they want to keep working to 65, 75 and beyond. So family, in their families, they're your classic sandwich generation. So that means that they've got two sides to, um, to attend to. They've got ageing parents and they've got children and grandchildren. So they're kind of sandwiched in the middle. So they may have had some sense of freedom for a couple of years when the kids left home, but then soon they've got more things to do in terms of looking after kids and kids and parents. So it can be a little bit of a, a pain period. Seeing more reluctant grandparenting. So it, it's very cultural. So in European cultures, you don't get a lot of a reluctant grandparent parenting, but in Western cultures, you do. So the average age for a grandparent in Australia is 58. So at 58, uh, you're still working full time. So there's not a lot of time to take off work and look after the grandchildren as your child might expect that you do. So there's, this, um, there's now some talk about having a contract with your child when they get pregnant about what level of care you're going to give to your grandchild. So it's all very clear and expectations are set, which I think is a great idea. Uh, <laughs> point to my daughter there. Um, but yes, it's just we have this idea of, of grandparents that's totally different to reality. So, you know, within the next 10 years, I'll be a grandparent. I don't think I'll look or behave much differently to what I am today. So there's a reluctancy there. Uh, this is a very big change in demographics. So more people in this cohort are single due to divorce than death. So 30 years ago, it was death. So the death of their spouse, now it's divorce. So you've got a lot of people in this age group who are single and on the market. So gym memberships for men, for instance, are very high in this group because they've let themselves go over the years. They find themselves single, suddenly they've got to get into shape. So their ex-wives can look at them and say, why didn't you do that when you were with me? 23% financially support their children. It's a really high figure. This is an Australian figure. Um, so that's often in the case of either cash or um, educational support, paying for kids' private school education. Um, help with house deposits, etc. But it's not uncommon for them to continue to support their children even once their children are, are a lot older. But a lot of them are the ski generations, so spending kids' inheritance. So the idea of the inheritance used to be something that you passed down to generations, normally a property. So the family property was passed down to the children, to pass down to their children, etc. But now once mum and dad have gone, property gets sold, it gets divided between the kids and pays off their mortgage. So a lot of people are thinking, well, bugger that. I've worked hard for it, so I'm going to reverse mortgage my house and spend it so that my kids don't have any money left. Hopefully my parents won't do that. I think it's a very bad thing to do. Not really. Okay, so what are they doing for leisure? So 54% of all travel spending is with this group, and there's no surprises there. The cruise business um, is booming. And it's actually one category that really caters beautifully to this target consumer. Their service is outstanding. So they're spending a lot of money on their travel. Also, our economy has, has flipped from a goods economy to a service economy. And that's in part having this group not being catered to by the goods industry. So they're swapping their money to the service industry. They need somewhere to spend their disposable income. So they're spending it where they feel good, and that's in services. They're also spending money on multi-generational travel, so taking themselves, their parents, their kids, their grandkids on holidays. They spend 38% of their food budget on eating out. So if you go to any restaurant in Melbourne any, any day of the week, you'll see 80% of um, the restaurant will be filled with uh, q threes. They're boozers. 50% of all alcohol spending is done by 50 to 75s. So there we go. So as you can see, from hair salons to gyms to... Um, beauty products to health products, they're, they're absolutely huge. They're the, biggest, they're, the biggest game in they're the biggest game in town by far. So why do we dread heading into this stage of life? Why are Q3s placed on a scrap heap in the workplace, ignored by the retail sector and placed into passive roles by the families? What is it about Western society that doesn't like the thought of ageing? 
So age, ageism is actually the most irrational form of discrimination. By being ageist, we're discriminating against our future selves. Unlike discriminating against women or a particular race, religion or sexual orientation, men, women, straight, gays, Jews, Christians, Muslims were all guaranteed to either grow old or die. Most of us want to grow old rather than die young. Even Pete Townsend, who wrote the famous My Generation, says the lyric, I hope I die before I get old, is more about a state of mind than an actual age, now that he's heading towards 70. Groucho Marx actually said, I don't want to join any club that would accept people like me as a member. And this can be said of ageing. We're all ageist, even those in their third quarter and beyond. Nobody wants to join the old club because old is bad and must be avoided at all costs. But this Groucho paradox is really self-defeating because we're all desperate to grow older because we want to avoid death. But this unhealthy dualism grows within our psyche and it's fed by our communities, our media and popular culture. So we maintain really damaging stereotypes of older people that are outdated and irrelevant. We feed these stereotypes to our children through children's books so they can self-discriminate at later stages of their life. If I were being rational, I would relish the Q3 years as a period to be seized and enjoyed. If we observed what an average 50, 60 or 70 year old actually looks like and how they behaved, we would register the truth. If we noticed what a grandparent looked like, a 58 year old person, we would break one of the society's most potent and damaging stereotypes. I mean, being 50, I can't say that in eight years time I'm going to sprout a bun, an apron, put on eight stone and move to a farm and bake cookies. And I can't see my husband hunched over with a cane and little glasses and white hair around his head and braces. And these are stereotypes that still persist. If you go to your local library and look at books about with grandparents involved, nine out of 10 will have that stereotype in. Just that the, the, the age that we're forming stereotypes, that three, four and five years old. If businesses were rational, they'd see the majority of their customers were Q3s they would make clothes that fit the Q3 body, products that fulfil Q3 desires, and provide services catering to Q3 needs. This is as relevant and as important to younger people than those living in their Q3 years. To recognise the enemies of your future self is a form of insurance. To help create a society where numbers on a birth date are irrelevant is in your own self-interest. To value the experience that you'll gain over the years and encourage people of all ages to pursue their life's ambitions will only assist you. However, the road to emancipation is tough. The words old, senior, retired, elderly, pensioner and others are loaded with negative connotations and there are no real alternatives. This is why I like Q3. We don't look forward to turning 50, 60 or 70. But there's no reason why this can't and won't change because rationally it should, it should change if we start using our brains rather than default positions. So it's easier to start. In fact, if you don't start and start, if you don't start targeting this consumer group, you won't be doing your job properly because you're missing out on 50% of your customers. So it's time to start targeting the largest consumer group on the planet and reap the rewards. And that is the end of my speech. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Um, I take part in running entrepreneurship programs that encourage people to pursue their own projects. Do you have any advice for someone in their 30s who would like to see more Q3s in the startup economy? Who can see more what? More Q3s. Yeah, look, I think that often Q3s feel intimidated by a, a, the younger crowd. I mean, I find because I'm in a creative industry in digital marketing, um, I'm surrounded by younger people. Mostly I work with people in their 20s and I find them extraordinarily welcoming, humble, asking questions, just fabulous. But you'll find most people in their Q3s feel quite intimidated. So I think that um, putting them into mentorship positions is probably a, a good idea so that they can start valuing their experience because remembering today, we don't value experience. So if you're not up to date with the latest trends and the latest training, you're behind. So we don't value years, we value currency. And it's quite a, a big flip to the way that we used to view people you know, as a human resource in the past. So I think going back and looking at the value that people can gain through their experience, you know, they've made a lot of uh, mistakes in the past, they can show you the holes in the road up ahead that you don't need to fall down. Focusing on that is probably a good, good idea. 
But yeah, I just think celebrating more. I mean, I can't, we have Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards. Well, why don't we have Senior Entrepreneur of the Year Awards and start talking about people who are starting businesses later? I mean, Colonel Sanders started KFC in his 70s. That's a great. long time ago. But. First off, thanks a lot. That was one of the most uh, informative talks I've come to a pause. Oh, thank um, you. A, a really hugely different perspective that I think is really valuable. Um, I wanted to ask, we've got this, this kind of, first off, we've got this aging population thing happening at the moment, and we've also got this technological shift where the next generation is supposedly more, more well-versed in the technologies that we're building. Um, do you see any of these stats or any of these ideas changing over the next, say, 10 or 20 years? Um, yep. So maybe um, Q3s will become more accustomed to phones rather than tablets because the, the previous generation has been using them more frequently? Yeah, definitely. I think that I've heard a lot about user experience at PauseFest. And this cohort has a very different user experience than the younger cohort. But phones are a great example. So Apple um, targets this consumer group very aggressively although not overtly. So the iPhone Plus is unashamedly built for Q3s. So you find that, you know, my mum will have one, they like a larger screen, it's a, Q <laughs> it's a Q3 product. So people are, smart people are doing it, but they're doing it sort of by stealth, no one's talking about it. But yeah, definitely, so they're moving from, you know, you'll find phones and tablets sort of merging, but yeah, the iPhone Plus is, is a classic. But I think, yeah, especially with apps, I think the user experience of an app there's got to be some work to be done there so that you know we can look at and see how Q3 is actually... I use a lot of apps myself, but there's got to be more research into how we can get them more engaged with technology. 